Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ on this proper five, Luke 7, 11 to 17, the raising of the widow's son at Nain. This is my first podcast with you during the Pentecost season, and I just wanted to share with you that this last winter for our sister seminary in St. Louis, I taught a D-Min course on all the Pentecost Gospels from Luke. And one of the things I did was I divided them into kind of sermon series so that you could actually preach the gospel um, as it kind of unfolds in this continuous reading as a sermon series. And this, of course, being the second one in the season of of Pentecost, uh, is part of a sermon series in Luke 7. We had the uh, centurion uh, last week. Now we have the widow's son at Nain. And then we have Jesus uh, and the the sinful woman in in the house of Simon. And, and you, can, you can preach those three together. Luke 7 does form its own sort of, you know, series. And, and I, I want to do that as I talk to you with the various texts that I talked to you about in this, um, this Luke and Pentecost season. Anyway, one of the things I did was I shared some of the things from my commentary. And I'll start there. This is a simple outline of the text where you have setting and then the response of the people. And the the center of it, of course, is the compassion of Jesus and the miracle. And, you know, by doing this, and I did this with the St. Louis brothers, I also did an entire conference in the uh, northern Minnesota, northern Michigan district, excuse me, uh, on all of these texts, too. I did 26 texts in four and a half hours. It's great fun. But, I mean, this could help you with preaching. If you do an expository sermon, you could easily do a sermon here where you have, you know, this as your outline. You know, you talk about the setting, what's significant about it, then the, the compassion, the miracle, and then how the people responds. This is a very important part of, of the meaning of this text. But anyway, let's, let's, let's look at the text itself here. And I have it marked up, as I like to do, to highlight some of the things that I think are really important in it. Um, first of all, in yellow here, I, I think <clears throat> just a couple of, of Lucan accents. And this is the season of Luke, so let's do it. You, you know that Kayagenita in Luke is the, the equivalent of the wow consecutive from the Old Testament. It, it shows the kind of the, the historical continuity of these texts. So, I mean, this is, and it came to pass. That's the King James Version. Um, And in in many ways, it also marks off a significant text. This is a nota bene. Now, why is this a nota bene? Well, there are two miracles in Luke's Gospel. One is this one, the widow's son at Nain. And the second one is in chapter 8, the next chapter, Jairus' daughter. And these resurrections are part of this pattern of release that Jesus demonstrates throughout his ministry. Namely, that he releases people from demons. Some of you have heard this from me on other texts. He releases people from sickness. He does this in Capernaum with the demon in 431 and following. The sickness is Peter's mother-in-law, which is right after that. Then there's sin and sickness together, and that's the paralytic in Luke 5. Uh, I think it's 17 and following. And now, number four, you have being released from death. So this is the final in a series of things that Jesus releases people from because the world has been infected with the virus of sin. So people become obsessed in body and soul with demons, Sickness really is a body and soul thing. Sin, you can't read that, but sin and sickness together, and then death. And this is the, the final one. And so it deserves a Kayagenita. That's sort of my point. This is a significant text. I don't want to make too much of this, but this is part of Luke's Lucan vocabulary of journey, that Jesus is always journeying on a pilgrimage. Obviously, Jerusalem is his destiny. But, you know, here he is with his disciples, you know, and I always look at what they're called here. They're called disciples. And, um, and Egidzo, to draw near. 
he drew near. I mean, he, he carries with him this eschatological presence, this healing, this, this release. And he is coming now, to, and notice it's the gate of the city. That's really interesting, the gate of the city. So, um, you know, the, 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 the freedom that Jesus brings by his presence, this release from these various kinds, and I call these this bondage, the bondage to all these things. Jesus comes bringing release. Um, the, the other word here in yellow is the word for mercy that we see in Luke's Gospel. Um, you'll see it in the Benedictus. You'll see it in the Good Samaritan, Prodigal Son. Here you see it. It's that bowels gushing forth in mercy. It's a great word for mercy. And that's, that's what characterizes the Lord here in his, his, um, the, the miracle of, of resurrection. Um, in green here, I have um, another very significant statement here, and, and I put it in green because I find this to be uh, uh, very kind of nota bene, note this well in, the, in the, the text. Here is where Jesus, who is clean and holy, touches something that is unholy and unclean. Now, this would have made a big impression on the first century audience. That Jesus is entering into a situation and actually touching the coffin. Renders him as somebody who is unclean. And yet, what he does by doing that is he, he releases when he speaks. Of course, it's his word that performs the great miracle here. But, I mean, the touch and the word, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, Luke doesn't have as much touching as Mark does, but here Jesus touches the coffin, renders himself unclean. And I think that's a really, really important part of understanding the meaning of this text. Um, okay, so we said, if you go back to this, this, this outline here, you can see that 11 and 12 is the setting, 13 to 15 is the, the, the main core of it, and then the response. So coming back now, looking at the Greek in 11 and 12, okay, so we're, we're here. What do we learn about the setting, and how would we preach on this? Well, we're obviously in Galilee, and Jesus is, is journeying. There's another word. I should have put that in yellow. He's journeying, so he's in Nain, so there's a specificity about it. You know, Nain in Galilee. So there's the place. I'm always looking at person, place, and things. Time. Uh, the persons um, is the, the disciples and the crowd. Okay? So they're, they're, they're the audience, the disciples and the crowd. So they're, they're the, 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 the observers of this. And, and it's a big group. They're seeing a resurrection. And then the ones who matter are the, <coughs> the dead man here and his mother who's a widow. And, and I, I won't go into this too much. She's, in many ways, the other main character. But you know the status of a widow. I mean, you talk about an outcast, a person who is without any resources. It is this widow. And um, it's, ve it's very important to recognize how the miracle happens to somebody who is at the bottom of the totem pole. Now, I think she obviously is sort of representative of all of humanity, that if we are honest with ourselves, are as much an outcast because of our sin and because of our depravity as she is an outcast because of the status of being a poor widow who doesn't really have anybody to depend on except this only begotten son who's dead. So she's really in desperation. 
And, you know, <clears throat> there's a, a great crowd of the city who is with her. So the widow is not alone. She has a crowd. And so you really have a huge number of people who are going to witness this miracle. Now, I, I think that's important because it's a resurrection, and this is going to blow people away. Okay, so there's your setting. Now, the miracle itself is defined by this compassion. And I, I think it's important to see this compassion here as, as being the beginning of the miracle. You know, the Lord has compassion on her, on this widow. That's right here, this widow woman. And he has an imperative, do not cry. And then he says, I say to you, this is to the, to the young man. I love that. That's the word that's used in Mark of the angels at the tomb and the naked young man. He's a young man. It's very specific. So this is somebody who, you know, everybody sort of knew in this town. Arise, be raised. I say to you, be raised. So do not weep. Be raised. Now, in a way, that's all that Jesus says. I mean, he has compassion, he touches it, you know, that's, that's, that's all he needs to say. And um, it's a, it's a, I mean, there's not, a, there's not a lot of the words of Jesus here. Do not weep, be raised. I should probably put the negative there. Do not weep, be raised. And the power of Jesus' word is the power over death. And you talk about a performative word, a word that has the power to create a reality, the word that has the possibility to release even somebody who is dead. Nobody does this. Now, there may be healings, there may be casting out demons, there may be other miracles, but boy, this one is, this is unique. Nobody does this. And I love, the, the, if, if, if this is divided this way, you know, the response is, of course, these last two verses. The, there's a response by the dead man, you know. He begins to speak, you know. He, he rises up and begins to speak. And you can, you can picture that. The guy's in the coffin and he, he sits forward and begins to talk to show that he's alive. And I, I love, you know, and he gave him to his mother, you know. I mean, that's that beautiful expression of his compassion that he has restored this only begotten son and now she's not destitute left alone she has this son who can take care of her i mean it's a great act of compassion across the board now the response in many ways is the most important part of the story because the response indicates to us how the people are perceiving it first of all they're afraid Okay, now I've talked about this before, but fear has to do with being in the presence of God. And that's why this word, draw near, is so important. They're, they're in the presence of the end times with Jesus, and they're afraid. This is a, a remarkable moment. And then they glorify God, so they're, you know, this is a, a liturgical response in a way. And, and this is important, a great prophet. I, I have spent a lot of time in my teaching to show that there is in Luke this prophet Christology. Here it's being affirmed again. This is a positive title in Luke. So they see him in line with the prophetic tradition. And in a sense, as we're going to see throughout this season, he's the fulfillment of that. God has visited his people. Now they, they, they say this is a visitation of God. Now, I don't want to make too much of this, but this is the word that is used in the Benedictus for the resurrection. Excuse me, for the incarnation. So they see this as a visitation of God. And I don't know that they're confessing Jesus is the Christ. It doesn't say that. But boy, they are struck by the fact that this is unlike anything else they have ever, ever experienced. And I think it's important to recognize that calling him a prophet puts him in line with the messianic prophecies. So they're beginning to see that maybe this Jesus is something beyond 
any other prophet. And the word, you know, went out, this word, in all the surrounding countryside concerning him. And, it, you know, his, this is one of those fame passages where Jesus' fame goes all the way over. Luke's got a bunch of these. You can find them at the end of certain pericopes. You know, it starts at the beginning, you know, in Luke 14, excuse me, chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. This is an incredible moment where, you know, Jesus comes up from the Jordan and, and you know, they, they, everybody knows who he is just before he even starts his ministry. And here, of course, he's raising the dead. I mean, it's an amazing moment. When you preach on this, one of the things that I think, especially in light of having come out of the Easter and, and now in the Pentecost season, is this is the place to preach the resurrection again. And if Jesus has the power to raise the dead, it testifies to his resurrection. And it testifies to our resurrection as well. Now, in many ways, that is what my suggestion would be as the theme of your sermon, that this is the first resurrection in Luke, and it shows how important the resurrection is. And, and Luke is the gospel of the resurrection. It points you to Luke 24, where you have the longest and most detailed description of Jesus in his resurrected presence in the synoptics. John has is, is probably got as much or more than Luke does. But in the synoptics, Luke 24 is the, is the longest and most detailed, you know, uh, chapter on the resurrection. And it, it, it shows you how important the resurrection is to understand all of theology. That you really can't understand Jesus until after he has been raised from the dead. And you can't really understand it until you read back the words of Jesus through the resurrection. And here you have the first text that records Jesus having the power over death. And, you know, I know it's, it's, it's a June text, you know, people are maybe not thinking of death, but the fact of the matter is that everything we do and everything we say in the pulpit has to do with suffering and death and how we come to understand that. And so the fact that we have this great declaration of Jesus to the young man, I say to you, be raised up. That is the great theme of the Pentecost season. And in many ways, that is the great theme of the Christian life. 